Good morning. It's an awesome privilege to be here. Thank you, Chris, for asking me to speak this morning. Before we begin, where's John Orr? Would you stand, John? John has some pamphlets he's going to hand out at the end, so make sure you get one. It's about my major purpose for being here, other than seeing all of you, is to uh, work with home missions and to encourage domestic mission, the mission of the church to evangelize America, that the whole world will continue to be evangelized from generation to generation. We're going to have a luncheon on Friday. I'm going to be speaking. John will be there. But uh, you need to learn more about home missions because uh, any of us that work on behalf of God's kingdom in the United States needs to be either a part of encouraging home missions to take place or being an active uh, and involved person in that work. Let's pray and ask God to be with us as we study his word. Father, thank you for blessing us and asking us to be co-workers together with you and planting the gospel seed. You make it grow. We can plant and water and fertilize. We cultivate the ground. We do all that's necessary for hearts to be ready, but only you can make an atoned, sacri- uh, an atoned redeemed soul from someone that's lost. Bless us in our efforts. Be with us as we study your word. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. You ever been to one of those events or seen one like a Somebody being inducted into the Hall of Fame, it doesn't matter what sport, just being conducted into the Hall of Fame. Or maybe one of those awards banquets where they give out a Lifetime Achievement Award. Can you imagine somebody trying to do that? Or what would they say as they presented God with an award for his greatest achievements? I think that's what Paul's trying to accomplish here as he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes to the Colossian church, beginning with verse 13 in Colossians chapter 1. He talks about God's greatest work. He says he is, is verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. One of the greatest, if we were to begin to list all the greatest achievements, God's greatest moments, certainly creation would be right at the top of the list. Creation, the power that was demonstrated, leaves any unbeliever without excuse, Romans chapter 1. If we just look at what we see and we say, we see his infinite wisdom and his power and his deity clearly displayed in front of us. And so unbelievers are without excuse. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 12. Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, I am the one who created the earth and created people to live on it. Not Isaiah saying that about himself, but Isaiah saying that as God speaks through him to his people. I'm the creator of this universe. With my hands I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. Without a question. As he is presented with an achievement award for what he's done. Certainly we have to praise him and magnify his name because of creation. He is the designer. He brought everything into being. Whether you're looking through a telescope at the cosmos, at the whole universe, or you're looking through a microscope at an atom, you see, you see order. And he's to be praised and glorified for all that we see. He holds it all together, the Colossian writer says. Certainly right along next to that and equal to it is the incarnation. God became flesh and dwelt among us. One of his greatest moments is when he visited this planet. Out of all of creation, he came here to redeem mankind for his own, his own purpose. And not just for eternal praise and glory in heaven forever, but that we would glorify him and serve him and accomplish his purpose right here on planet Earth. But his incarnation, he came here to show us his holiness. In him all things, he goes on to say in chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 19 and 20. In him all things, all the fullness of God, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. The Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. The Word is with God. 
and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and John in his letter says, we saw him with our eyes, we heard him with our ears, we touched him with our hands. He was here all right. And the world's never been the same since. Certainly if we were to say, well, great achievement, incarnation would have to be right there at the top of the list. Others would say, and rightfully so, the power of God demonstrated at the resurrection. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. If 10,000 years from now, when we're all up there in heaven, around God's throne, praising Him and magnifying Him, if someone were to ask, you know that planet that we lived on back there 10,000 years ago? From the time that God created it to the time He destroyed it, what was the greatest event during that whole history of planet Earth? What was the greatest event that ever took place there? And right at the top of the list would have to be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When he purchased us and brought us into his kingdom and made us a part of his eternal purpose. Certainly one of the greatest moments would be the resurrection. He is the head of the body, he goes on to say in Colossians 1.18. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn, the preeminent one over all that have been raised from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, number one. Designated Son of God by His resurrection from the dead in Romans 1.4. Certainly, creation, incarnation, resurrection. But I think His greatest moment is repeated over and over and over again when redemption takes place. When we surrender our lives to His Lordship and He takes away our sin, he gives us His Spirit. He adds us to His family. And He redeems us, buys us back from the broken relationship we had because of sin. And if His greatest moment is to repeat it, be repeated over and over and over again for another generation, as we remind a generation of people on planet Earth who He is, what He's done, but what He continues to do, and that His love is forever. So in Colossians 1, 20 through 22, he says, Through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. As a result, he has brought you into his presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. God's greatest work. His greatest work in my life was when he redeemed me. How about you? Amen? Amen. And there's a whole world out there that needs to be reminded of God's greatness and redemption that he offers to every single human being. This generation as this entire week will be reminded of the things that we need to remind the world, another generation of people on planet Earth, what God has done, what He is doing, what He's planned to do. But we, the church, need to be reminded of the place in His eternal plan that He has put us and the work that we are to do. We are co-workers together with Him. Paul makes reference to that in 1 Corinthians 3. We're laborers together with Him. We cultivate the soil by going into the world and starting conversations, building relationships, so that we can plant the gospel seed, telling every person on earth what God has done for them. God is the one who makes it grow. He's the only one that will. He's the only one that has the power to make it grow. The power of salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1.16. But he has us as co-workers together with him. Romans. Chapter 10, beginning with verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. We're in no place to be determining who's, who's eligible to be God's people. He loves every single one of them. You'll never meet anybody that he doesn't love. And so he says, for there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all. And he bestows his riches upon all who call upon him for everyone who calls upon the Lord will be saved. And he starts this 
absolutely soul-searching for the church. We need to be reminded this is our role, and it should be a soul-searching list of rhetorical questions. The answer's obvious. How are they to call upon somebody they don't believe in? This is a paraphrase, but an accurate statement of what he's saying. How are people going to call on him for salvation if they don't believe in him? And how would they ever believe in him if they don't hear of him? Here's the one that really gets us. It should. The church in the 21st century needs to be reminded, how will they hear without somebody telling them? And why in the world would we put ourselves in that place uh, of trying to tell somebody else about the goodness and the greatness of God unless we realize that He sent us to do that very thing into every person that we meet, in every relationship that we have, every corner of planet Earth that we go, every place that we go. He is just as powerful as He ever was. He's still doing His great work, but He's made us co-workers together with Him, and He wants us to do our work, what He's given us to do. God's greatest moment is the redemption of another soul. To repeat it, be repeated over and over and over again. We must do what he's given us to do. He'll do what he promised to when we tell the good news. The power of God and his ability to convert people's hearts is still as powerful as it ever was. The God of creation is still at work. He's at work in you. He works through you. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still keeps every promise, just as he did to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the Exodus, that part of the sea, still is able to save nations from the slavery of sin, just as he saved the Israelites from slavery. He saves people today from the slavery of sin. The God of the prophets still controls the nations to bring them to bring about his plan and his completion of his plan when we do what the prophets did, simply give the message of God to the people. The God who became flesh and blood and proved his power over nature by stopping storms, walking on the water, changing water into wine and healing the lame that they might walk and raising people from the dead. He's still just as powerful as he ever was. And by the Spirit of God that's at work within you, we are able to do together, collectively, as the body of Christ. And we as individuals in people's lives are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that he asks or imagines when we simply do what he asks us to. And that's to tell people of the greatness and the goodness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's happened to us? His church. As I travel around the country, my wife and I are so blessed to have opportunities to travel and to work with churches all over the country. In many places that we go, the church, the congregation that meets in some town has completely forgotten their purpose for being there. They need to be reminded. Many of you, students here at Sunset, will go out and those are the places that you'll go to. Those are the places that you'll be sent. But they might be reawakened to their very purpose for being in that town, to be a light to the world, to be a a bastion of hope and redemption to a lost and dying world. People, we hear it on the news every day, people living in hopeless desperation, clinging to drugs and everything else to try to find some hope to cloud the issues so that they have some, some, just some measure of some hope when the only hope And the only answer to this world's problems and every person's problem is Jesus Christ. He sends us to tell him. We are co-workers together with him. But the power is in the gospel that we tell for salvation. It's always been, still is, and always will be. We are the only ones that have been sent. He has no backup plan. He has designed us for a specific purpose. As Chris mentioned, I, I spend some time painting pictures. It pays better than preaching, you know. <laughs> and we have supported our ministry uh, by many of the paintings that I've sold. 
I guess maybe I'm intrigued by this illustration, maybe more than some, but there was an artist that was uh, asked to go to a gallery, and they were going to put, they were going to do his show. I mean, all the artwork was taken down, and only his paintings were put up. And right centerpiece of his collection was a painting that was entitled Christianity. It looked like this. It was a picture of a, of a rushing stream, and the stream was called Sin, and there were bodies being washed down the stream. In the middle of the stream was an island, and right on the edge of the island was this cross, and there was one particular individual that with both hands was clinging to the cross to be kept from being swept away by the rushing river of sin. And his title was Christianity, and he had invited one of his artist friends to come and see his show, and he noticed that the artist friend was standing in front of this picture just looking at it and shaking his head. And he went over and he said, you don't agree with my rendition of Christianity? He said, not at all. He said, this is my show, but I invite you as an artist to go ahead and paint what you would picture as Christianity, and I'll give you a space right next to it. You'll be the only painting other than mine in the place. A few days later, he came back with his painting and hung it right next to it. It was very similar. It was a picture of a rushing stream called Sin, and bodies were being washed down. There was an island with a cross near the edge, and there was a person clinging to it, but only with one hand, while he reached out into the stream to bring others to the cross. Christianity isn't just our redemption. It's we are the messengers of redemption to all mankind. The grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men. It not only teaches us how to say no to sin, but helps us as we zealous with the deed that he's given us, go out to save, to reach out to plant seeds, that redemption can take place. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, you're a chosen race, brothers and sisters. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were no people, now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are in no place to judge somebody else as to whether they will be receptive. We need to view every single person we see as a receptive soul until they prove otherwise. And share the gospel with them with patience and joy and hope and confidence that God will do his work when they surrender their hearts to him. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. Brothers and sisters, we need to remind the church that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God has been made known. There's no other, nobody else to do it. He hasn't designed anybody else for this purpose. And we need to be reminded. It's through the church that the manifold wisdom of God has been made known, through the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. This is according to his eternal purpose, which he realized in Christ Jesus. Crucifixion, yes, one of God's greatest moments. Incarnation became flesh and dwelt among us. Surrendered his life for our redemption, death, burial, and resurrection, the power of the resurrection, greatest moment. But his greatest moment is to be accomplished over and over and over again through you and me. What are we to tell the world? The immeasurable greatness of his love demonstrated in the cross of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I want to end with the 107th Psalm. Oh, thanks be to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed, that's you and me, brothers and sisters, that's every person in God's kingdom. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say what? The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the, Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he redeemed from, his, from trouble and gathered in from the east and the west and from the north and the south. Listen to this as he describes where we were spiritually before we heard the good news. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, spiritually speaking, 
hungry and thirsty, and their souls fainted within them. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. The city's called God's kingdom, his church. He'll take us home to be with him forever. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the sons of men. We're thanking him for the wonderful work that he will repeat over and over and over again when we deliver the message of how God great, how great God is and his steadfast love is for every soul that we'll ever meet. God bless you in your work. We've got a lot of people to remind and a lot of people to tell. God bless you. Thank you.